And um, let's get started. So um, good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon's public lecture, which we're running as part of the AHRC funded project, Grief, a Study of Human Emotional Experience at the University of York. My name is Becky Miller, and I'm a postdoctoral research associate for this project, working alongside Matthew Ratcliffe, Louise Richardson, Emily Hughes, and Eleanor Byrne. The overarching aim of this four-year project is to develop a detailed, wide-ranging, and integrated account of what it is to experience grief. For more details about this project and upcoming talks, you can visit our website at griefyork.com, or you can follow us on social media with the Twitter handle at griefyork. Today, we're delighted to welcome Dr. M. Catherine Shear, who will give a lecture titled Introduction to Prolonged Grief Disorder Therapy. Dr. Shear is the Marion E. Kenworthy Professor of Psychiatry and the founding director of the Centre for Complicated Grief, which I think has now been renamed to Prolonged Grief instead, um, at Columbia School of Social Work. For the past two, de two decades, she's focused on what is now referred to in the DSM-5 as Prolonged Grief Disorder, for which Dr. Shear has developed a targeted psychotherapy. This afternoon's lecture will run, run for approximately an hour with half an hour afterwards for questions. Please note that we're recording this talk, but the recording will stop before the Q&A. Um, with that, I'd like to warmly welcome Dr. Shear to speak with us. Thanks so much, Becky. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to share my screen because I do have slides. And um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk with you. And it's amazing to be able to be here in such an easy way. I know we're, we're, we would all prefer that we were in person in many ways, but it's also so simple. And um, I, I do kind of appreciate that. So I am going to talk about prolonged grief disorder, which just a month ago, there was a press release from the American Psychiatric Association announcing the publication or the inclusion of prolonged grief disorder as a new diagnosis in the DSM-5, and it will be in print in the DSM-5 TR, which is expected to be published in March of this year. So what I'm going to talk about is, first of all, I am going to show you three videos of people who have had this condition. And these are actually quite emotional. We're going to start there. And they're, they're quite emotional. Most people who watch them um, do get pretty emotionally activated. And if you're, if you're in a place where that's going to be even more so, please do take care of yourself. But then we're going to move into um, a, a way to understand grief that we have developed and now use in providing prolonged grief disorder therapy. And along with that, sort of what, what it is, sort of conceptually what it is, and also diagnostically what it is, what we mean by prolonged grief disorder, because there is, I think, some, still some ongoing confusion about that. And probably we, there are still things we need to work out. But, and, um, and then we're going to talk about the treatment. And I'm going to talk, talk to you about the treatment. And at the end, we'll, I'll return to the videos and show you what the what the, these were three people who participated in our very earliest work. So to start, this is the videos. My involvement in the treatment was around the death of my mother. Um, however, my husband died um, about two or three years later. Um, and I think that really exacerbated the situation. Um, but my mom was almost 85 years old um, had really only been ill for less than a month, and she passed away. We were very, very close. I could not imagine living without her. I never really recovered, because her death left this gaping hole uh, inside of me. And although my husband was still alive, he wasn't my mom. Um, so I sort of just kind of wandered around through life. I recall looking out uh, my bedroom window and being a little angry because everybody else in the world seemed to just be going on their merry way as though nothing has happened. I'm thinking, how can you do this? Don't you know that the world has lost somebody, you know, wonderful? My 19-year-old daughter Jackie died in a car wreck 
on August 21st of the year 2000. Uh, she was out that evening I was told to come home at midnight. She got home about quarter to 12. Uh, she was real excited, uh, asked me if she could go out and say goodbye to one more friend because she was, uh, we were taking her to college on that Tuesday morning. And she left and I went to bed and we got a phone call at about 3.15 in the morning asking us if our daughter was home. I jumped out of bed and went to her room and, and she had, she wasn't there. There wasn't, not a whole lot that I remember about that morning uh, other than and sitting in total disbelief and uh, didn't want to eat didn't want to do anything, spent most of the day crying. It felt like somebody had tore my heart out. It was my little girl. Well, as, as time went on, I found that I wasn't progressing or uh, being able to focus myself on work, on anything that I'd like to do. All I could find myself doing is going to work, um, getting some work done, going in the back room crying a lot. The more I thought about it, I, I realized that I wasn't doing anything with my life. It's been 20 years. Uh, my husband died um, at a relatively young age. He was 53. And I got stuck. I just couldn't move on from that. I just grieved and grieved and grieved. And I thought that somehow that it was my fault that I hadn't been able to diagnose his tumor. So then when he died, there was just this giant hole that um, just seemed impossible to fill. For years, I had horrible nightmares. You know, I would, and I'd wake up in the morning and I'd think, no, this did not happen. He's still here. I didn't care whether I lived or died at that point, to be honest, but I had this child. So I would lay on the couch and cry every night, and then I would get up in the morning and I would go to work and do my job, and then I would come home and I would lay on the couch and cry. And I did that for years. That's all I could do. I was paralyzed. So these, um, these people we're all experiencing what we now are calling prolonged grief disorder. As I said, it was um, announced in a press release on September 23rd that um, this is a new diagnosis. And, um, and basically what it is, is, is basically persistence of what we're gonna call in a moment, persistence of the experience of what we call <clears throat> Um, acute grief, sorry, <clears throat> um, beyond the time that we would ordinarily expect it to last. And that time frame for the World Health Organization is at least six months. And for the DSM, it's, it's it, for the American Psychiatric Association, it's at least 12 months. So, you know, there's a little variation in the time frame. But I want to start really by going back over, um, not sure if you're seeing that scratch in the middle of the, um, something looks like it happened, but um, go back, go back and talk about how, how people get there, how we think people get there at least. And, and so we, we have to start with grief itself. So grief, as we know, is the natural response to a meaningful loss. And our work has focused exclusively on loss of a loved one almost exclusively on loss of a loved one to death. And so that's a particularly intense and you know, powerful form of grief. But of course, we do grieve other things as well. But this is what we're talking about today. And what we've learned over the, the years that we've been doing this is that grief is not, it's not just an emotion. A lot of people 
define it as an emotion and you know there's no right or wrong when you're talking about definitions really i mean even the the dictionary i i found out has changed its definition of grief over the miriam webster has changed its diction um miriam webster has changed its definition over over the time i've been working in this field and i think to a better place but but in any case we consider it to be the the sort of full body and mind response and really social and spiritual response, the whole experience really of the loss. Um, so it's complex, it's multifaceted, it varies over time. It doesn't move forward in any kind of predictable stages and, and um, but it does evolve as we make peace or adapt to the loss and all the changes that it brings. And because the, the death itself is permanent, grief is also going to be permanent we're never going to be we never are going to stop experiencing the loss in some way or other but as we'll talk about it it tends to quiet down and soften and kind of move into the background but it's not gone altogether and of course you know in the grief field we always say everyone grieves in their own way and that's of course entirely true and not only does everyone grieve in their own way each of us grieves each loss that we have in a unique way. Still, there are important commonalities. And one of them seems to be that prolonged grief can occur when there are certain early coping responses that um, persist in a, in a way that interferes with our ability to adapt to the loss. And I think you can see the commonality, actually, if you, if you think back to the three people we watched, they experienced different kinds of loss. They were very different people. Um, the, the, loss, the person they lost was different and the way the person died was different. And yet when they get to the place of prolonged grief, um, or prolonged grief disorder, they're very similar. They're, and that's one of the things that we've, we've seen. We've looked in a scientific way or in a, in a sort of researchy way to see if we could see any, any differences. And we see almost no differences across the different kinds of losses that we've seen over the years. Um, so let's go back and think about where, <clears throat> where does this come from? You know, we, we kind of asked the question of, you know, what is it? What is, what is grief really? Why is it so profound? Why is it so powerful? Why is it so um, kind of complex? And, and I think when we, when we think about where it comes from, it really is rooted in the loss in, in, in love, basically. So we know that there is a kind of biological motivation, so to speak, to seek form and maintain close relationships with a small number of people in our lives. That's what kind of attachment theory is all about. And, <clears throat> and there's, there's a huge amount of literature now on attachment theory, a huge amount of, of research that's documented various aspects of it. And I'll talk about a little of that today, but, um, but basically an, an, an attachment relationship is one way of describing a love relationship. And it's, its characteristics are that it's a relationship with someone that we care a lot about and we want to all things being considered all things being equal we want to be together and not separated and we we also um th these are people who make us feel safe they are our safe haven so to speak and our secure base and that means they they're there for us when things aren't going well and they're also there for us when when things are going well and they encourage us to go forward in our life to do things to do new things and take chances and do risks and perform out in the world and all things like that so they're really important and we all know that we know who the people that we really care about are and we know how important they are but actually it turns out that they may be even more important than we know they are because there are a whole um a whole series of of um, ex sort of research findings now that document the importance of relationships as regulators of a whole range of psychological processes. They clearly are involved in our sense of self. And this occurs, these, these kinds of effects on 
our psychology occur both in and out of awareness, importantly out of awareness, or in the part of the brain that we might think of as the more intuitive side that we sometimes call implicit cognition, but it's really, it's really our intuition and our, our sense, our sense out of sort of out of the usual way we think about cognition. Um, and, and it turns out they also affect a whole range of physiologic processes. And so there are actually, if you're interested, there are at least one, there's at least one study for each one of these um, processes that are listed on this slide. Usually there's more than one. So I can make those available if you want. And there, there are other, in this way of thinking about, about our sort of biology, there's, there are other biobehavioral motivational systems. And two of them in particular, I think, are important in grief and are linked also to the attachment system. One of them is the caregiving system, which is actually the reciprocal of attachment. So this is our natural motivation to provide someone with a, with a safe, to, to be the safe haven and the secure base for someone else. And that's actually really important. It's a really important system. It is linked to attachment, but it's not the same. <clears throat> and um, it turns out that in, and this is, I think if you stop and ask yourself, you would, you would understand this, that but it, it's generally more important for our well-being, for our sense of ourselves, for our, um, our feeling good feelings about ourselves to feel that we're effective as caregivers it's even more important than feeling that we're effectively taken care of we we do kind of need both but but caregiving is important and is <clears throat> often um, not included in discussions of grief and similarly um, the exploratory system <clears throat> is the natural, sorry, the natural sort of motivation that we have to go out and explore the system, the, the world and learn new things and do things in the world, et cetera. And when our attachment relationships are stable, and especially when they're secure and, and stable, um, <clears throat> we, um, we do that naturally. But when something threatens our attachment relationships, an important attachment relationship, then that kind of shuts down the exploratory system. So if we ask ourselves, what happens to these systems when someone close dies? This slide shows you basically. And on the left side, I'm going to let you watch this for a minute and I'm going to mute myself for one second because my throat is a little bit rough. Okay, I think that's a little bit better. Um, anyway, the, on the left side is what happens to the attachment system when it's when there's a meaningful separation, which I think you could say death is. And on the right side is what we experience when we experience grief. And this is why we say, we kind of have a, a sort of mantra at the Center for Complicated Grief or the Center for Prolonged Grief, which is that grief is literally the form love takes when someone we love dies. And this is where, this is part of where this comes from. The other part is from, just reading people's accounts of grief. And this one comes from C.S. Lewis, A Grief Observed, which you may be familiar with. And really basically his point here is that, is basically that, that bereavement is not a, a sort of what he calls a truncation of the process of love, but one of its phases. That's really what, that's what I think he's saying here. And um, and he says it, of course, very, very beautifully. And he says more than that. But importantly, what he's talking about here is that is that we shouldn't think of, of bereavement and grief and the whole experience of the loss of a loved one as being something that ends anything, but rather, you know, rather it's the continuation, it's the form our love takes, in other words. But 
grief is more than that. It's more than the form love takes. It's also the response to what, uh, what is one of life's most severe and difficult stressors. So, and that's because it's it, it, just the loss of that person who's providing the secure base and the safe haven and all those regulatory functions we just looked at would be stressful enough. But it, it also, the loss of someone close typically brings a whole range of other challenges or stressors. And there are some examples of them are listed on this slide. So there are all kinds of additional stressors that come along and that taken together makes this a highly, highly stress, stressful experience. And so the response to that stressful experience is almost by definition, a stress response. And not only is, is, the, is grief a response to stress, but grief itself becomes stressful because of the intense emotional pain that typically accompanies grief, that we know accompanies grief. And also because we very often have a whole range of confusing thoughts and mixed feelings or some of the, again, these are just examples of them because they can be in a lot of different other directions as well. But these are very typical that we want to, we want grief to go away, but we actually don't. We also want to hold on to it. We want to be free of the pain, but then we also often we feel like we should be in pain and, and we want to move on with our own life, but we also don't want to do that without the person who died. And we feel a need for other people, but it's hard to connect to them. We know that the loss is real, but we sort of can't, often can't <clears throat> wrap our minds around it. And we, we crave that closeness to the person who died. But then at the same time, we want to avoid reminders because they activate our grief. And, and we don't want to stop thinking about the person and how much we care about them. But then that becomes frustrating because thoughts are all that we have. So grief is very stressful, but there's one more thing, and that is that important losses permanently changed the world we live in. And that's the world we live in, the internal world we live in, and also the external world. It's not kind of either or, it's both. And so, I mean, actually someone who I know very well recently lost um, their, their spouse and, and a couple of weeks later, they said to me, you know, I had no idea that my whole life, my whole life would be turned upside down by this loss. I mean, I knew it was going to, you know, it was important. And I, of course, I feel very strongly, but my whole life is upside down. I can't kind of find my way. So we, we have to adjust to the way that our lives get turned upside down. And adapting is how we adapt, adjust to change. So um, adapting does help reduce the stress, but it's, you know, it's not the same, quite the same as coping, but it's, it is um, the way that we need to move forward in order to be able to kind of regroup and move forward in our life in a meaningful way. And one of our premises is that, that it happens naturally if we don't get in our own way. So people who have prolonged grief disorder are, they do have a natural kind of capacity, a, a kind of a psychological immune system that will help them move forward if we can help get the things that are not, you know, that are sort of blocking them out of the way. So that's one of the things we're going to be thinking about as we move forward in this talk. But first, I want to just, just um, make the point that you know, coping and adapting, we often use those words interchangeably, especially in psychology we do, but they're not really the same. At least they're not, they, sometimes they are, sometimes they, they work together, but sometimes they work at cross purposes, which we'll get into. But I think if you just look at the images here, you can see the main differences in between coping and, and adapting, because coping is something that we do to, to manage stress that's kind of in our face, you know, that's here, that's that's um, confronting us pretty much in the moment. And when we stop coping, when the stress is removed, when, if, we, if we succeed in, in, um, in addressing or managing the stress, then we can move on and we don't, you know, it's sort of a problem solved. And we have to use our resources to do that as that little character is clearly using resources to hold up the, 
you know, keep them from being knocked over. Adapting is is kind of different. It's it's more how we how we make changes in ourselves, in our own expectations, in our automatic thoughts and behaviors, to um, to to basically um, adjust to a new kind of environment, basically. So it's a more long-term ongoing process. It maybe ends when the adjustments have been made. It's motivated by change, which is not always the same thing as stress. It's, sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. And it tends, importantly, to build new resources as opposed to using old ones. And um, so we're going to talk about coping and adapting as being kind of different. And that's important to our model also. So coping, again, is minimizing or eliminating the impact of stress. And in the grief world, we talk about loss-focused and restoration-focused um, coping. That's a whole area that um, Maggie Stroby and Hank Schutt in the ne Netherlands introduced to the field in 1999 with had a huge impact. Um, but it's not, it, I'm not going to get into it in any depth here, but suffice it to say that we use all the different ways of coping we have in these situations to do the kinds of, because we have a lot of stress, as we were just talking about, in grief. So sometimes we use avoidant coping, sometimes we use active coping, sometimes we have to problem solve, and sometimes we just have to find a way to manage our emotions. And using some combination of all of these is, is usually very, um, very adaptive and helpful in terms of the, the success rate of, of coping. What we do to adapt, as I said before, is change our expectations and automatic behaviors. And that's a kind of different process. So the basics of adaptation as we see it are that we need to accept the reality that's the new reality, which of course includes the loss itself and its finality, but also in the, in the permanence of grief that goes along with that, but also the other changes that uh, accompany the loss. And, and um, one of those big changes is a change in our relationship to the person who died. We don't end our relationship. Um, I mean, it, it, it's really kind of almost not possible to end our relationship because it is, it's too much in the world and too much in, in ourselves. But we do have to, we, we do have to kind of accept the reality of that change. And then on the other hand, we have to restore our capacity really for well-being. And we think of this in terms of self-determination theory that was put forward by Edward Dietschy and Richard Ryan, also around the year 2000, in which they, they were um, kind of thinking about a, a whole range of studies that had been done, looking at what, what is it that people need to do in order to thrive in their lives. And those studies often out of the educational literature actually um, suggested that, that what we need is to have a sense of autonomy, competence, and relatedness. And what they mean by autonomy is basically to do things that are what are called intrinsically motivated, which is how we have a sense basically of purpose and meaning and, and happiness. It, really true happiness comes from doing things that are connected with what we call intrinsic motivation, which is our, our um, feelings of um, that we're, you know, feeling the things that we're truly interested in and our core values when we do things related to that. That's what they mean by autonomy. And competence is basically having the feeling that we can face and meet important challenges in our lives. And belonging and mattering um, really means that it's it's the feeling that we get um, from having satisfying relationships. So if we now kind of what we call reimagine grief, it's it's not, you know, it's it is the response to loss, which we can think of now as a response to a major life stressor and the form love takes when a loved one dies and a catalyst for adaptation. It's both a response to, it's going to become a response to adaptation and also a catalyst for that. So how do we experience grief? And we did see an example of this, of prolonged grief a few minutes ago, but in general, 
we're going to see grief emerge in what we call acute grief as strong emotions, strong insistent thoughts, grief related behaviors, physical symptoms and spiritual and social responses. And all of that kind of just fills up our mind and our life for a period of time so that it's really, it's really almost all that we care about. And, and because it's so powerful and so difficult and so emotional, we tend to um, develop some, we, we tend to make use of some natural defensive coping um, strategies or coping responses that are listed on this slide and that we're going to revisit in a couple of minutes. But they, they basically include that sense of disbelief and protest that almost every, we, we, I mean, I know my mother died in 1998 and I, I was with her at her bedside. She had been suffering from, <clears throat> from cancer. And, um, and so we had had a good two years to kind of be together and, and process that experience. So I was in a sense, well prepared, but I still remember the feeling, you know, right after she died was like, I don't understand, you know, where is she? I can't, I can't understand it. That sense of protest and, and that sense of disbelief rather. And, you know, and often accompanying that will be a, a feeling of no, you know, like, no, this shouldn't have happened. This can't have happened. This is wrong, et cetera. And then shortly after we might start imagining all kinds of alter alternative scenarios, sometimes called counterfactual thinking, which again is very natural. We're always going to do this, but it's really a question of what happens to these that's going to become important. We, that caregiver side of us, you know, sort of immediately thinks that we've failed. We are not being an effective caregiver when someone dies and we blame ourselves, or we might, we might be kind of what, what one of the people I worked with called a mother lion and sort of be angry at everyone else around who, who might have not, not done what we thought they should have done. So th there are all these kinds of, of sort of reactions that are essentially coping with this enormous life event that is not processable in, in the early period. So, we, so this is something I learned from John Bowlby one of your, um, your um, English psychiatrists and who's made a huge, huge contribution to our field. And, um, and you know, this is what he said in his lost book is that, that when something like this happens, which is damaging to us or the person, it's both, it's gonna, this, you know, the death of someone we, we love damages both our interests and the person we care about, we're, we're, our first impulse, our first psychological impulse is to try to fix it. And to do that, we draw on these natural kind of coping processes that we just looked at. Um, and they do help us a little bit. They give us a little bit of respite from the pain. And that's important in, in, in the sort of long run. But it's important to have respite in order to start to kind of come to terms with this, which is going to take a while. But we do need to relinquish these particular ways of dealing with the pain, because if not, it's going to actually get in the way of that process of adapting. And I'll show you how that happens. I hope I'll show you how. And, and Bowlby, again, makes this point. The criteria that most clearly distinguishes healthy from what he calls healthy from um, from pathological forms of what he calls defensive processes is the length of time during which they persist and this, the extent to which they influence us, whether they influence a part only of our mental functioning or come to dominate it completely. So that's, that's kind of what we're gonna be looking for here. And he further says that, you know, that it's merciful that we, that we kind of do this kind of, we, we give ourselves these kinds of respites that we have, that it's part of our nature to give ourselves respites, whether it's cognitively, whether it's behaviorally through avoidance, cognitively through, through protest, disbelief, um, imagining alternative scenarios, et cetera. But, you know, but eventually we have to resolve the dilemma of, of 
basically the, the dilemma of wanting to be with the person and keeping the person with us and letting go of them. And both of that's a real dilemma as far as he's concerned. And, um, and basically, you know, he's saying what we need to do is recognize our changed circumstances, which is what I just showed you is what we, we're calling accepting the reality of the loss and, and revising the representational models. That's the sort of, that's the changed relationship part. And then redefining goals in life. Um, basically, otherwise you end up in a state of suspended growth um, in which a person is held prisoner by this dilemma that they can't solve. So I think that's really what we're talking about also. So what we see though, importantly, is that as we, as we do solve that dilemma or adapt to the loss, grief is transformed and integrated and it, it kind of finds a place in our life. Our physiology, which was disrupted, is re-regulated. Our thoughts and memories that are so insistent and focused on the person who died recede. They're still, they're still accessible, of course. They're not gone, but they're much more distant. They don't, they don't dominate our mind. And the emotions also subside in intensity and, and often over time become bittersweet and definitely better regulated. And we start to reconnect with other people. And it's important to know though, that even when that happens, grief doesn't stay quiet all the time. And there are times when it can get pretty, even pretty intensely activated, but they tend to be short term. We can talk about that later if you want, but it is an important, you know, kind of piece of this. And this is another, you know, another sort of literary person, Denise Levertov, who who writes about you know how how accepting grief really is is such an important piece of this and um, I'm not going to read through this I think at this point so another way <clears throat> of thinking about this is using an infographic I mean I like to I like to sort of visualize things so this is really everything I just said but you know basically this is kind of how grief how we see grief moving kind of forward. So that as we adapt to the, um, the changes by accepting the reality and restoring our capacity to thrive and to, for well-being, um, the, this very intense acute grief is kind of softened and quieted and ends up integrated. And this is what we, given that, this is, a sort of infographic of prolonged grief, right? So this is this is what we're saying is happening with prolonged grief is that these um, these pause points become stuck points, and the pause points are defensive coping mechanisms. That's different language you can use for those. And when that happens, this process of adapting is just blocked off, and that's how we get. <clears throat> the disorder that is now in the World Health Organization's ICD-11, persistent pervasive yearning, longing, or preoccupation with the person who died, persisting at least six months and accompanied by other evidence of intense emotional pain such as, so this is more of a guideline. It's not, it's not really diagnostic criteria per se, but it, it, um, it sort of harmonizes well with the DSM-5 TR criteria, which also say um, persistent and pervasive yearning long or preoccupation with the deceased. That's, that's sort of an, an essential criterion for both of these um, diagnostic systems. And um, in this case, the death of the person at least 12 months ago as I mentioned earlier, and now we're going to say they have to have at least three of some very specific um, associated issues. And in both of these, you'll notice that the condition causes clinically significant distress, but an impairment really in, in functioning, in, in important areas of functioning, and also is, by the way, associated with important health and mental health consequences other than this. I mean, they, there's uh, elevated increase of um, an elevated rate of depression and other mental disorders as a consequence of pro untreated prolonged grief and also cardiovascular and immune system functioning is affected and there's cardiovascular disease and increased cancer rates. Um, 
So this is what we diagnose now. And you've had other talks I know on risk factors that have been very, you know, very, uh, very well done. And, um, but I'm just, there are individual variables like um, the, the um, a past history of depression or anxiety disorders, maybe any past history of mental disorders is a risk factor for prolonged grief disorder. And the way the person dies, a, a person who's very close to, to, um, to the bereaved person, that's a risk factor. The circumstances of the death, sudden unexpected death, especially by violent means, um, the death of someone young, circumstances of the death like COVID circumstances of the death, um, definitely risk factors and the context for grief. And again, these are all things that we've seen recently with COVID. And again, I know you've had other speakers about this um, spoken very eloquently. We do have one pilot study that I know is, I think there, we still don't have data about this, but um, this, and this study is very small and it's not a representational sample really. So I, I think we have to, we have to think of it with a, a kind of a grain of salt, so to speak. Um, and um, and its rates are extraordinarily high because the, the overall rate that we generally think of prolonged grief disorder as occurring in roughly seven to 10% of brief people. So it's not, this is a way elevated rate and maybe it's not gonna be that elevated. But <clears throat> um, so let's just summarize this by saying that the way that we think about prolonged grief disorder is that these defensive coping, natural defensive coping responses persist with too much influence on our mental functioning. And so that leads to um, sort of derailing of the adaptive process. And that in turn prevents the usual evolution of grief. So we have that persistence of that very acute, intense, grief response, but it's not a completely different way of grieving. That's very important to recognize. And also, it, it, instead, it's rather a continuation of, of natural grief or whatever you want to call it, usual grief behind, beyond the time that it usually takes to come to terms with a loss. And so that tells us that what we want to do for a treatment is to remove the impediments and facilitate adaptation. So that's really what we do. And I'm going to tell you briefly how we do it and what we found happens when we do it. So what we found is that a way to facilitate those two processes of accepting the reality and, and um, restoring the capacity to thrive are to work with what, what we're calling healing milestones. And there are seven of them. One is to understand and accept grief. That's the Denise Levertov idea of accepting grief into our lives. Manage emotions, and this means both the painful emotions, of course, but also positive emotions, to be able to help people start to see a promising future, to help them strengthen their relationships, to help them develop a coherent narrative of the story of the death, to learn to live with the reminders that tend to activate intense grief. And so to be able to learn to live with them in a way that they don't activate so much and that when they do activate the grief, the person can manage that. And then lastly, to be able to connect with the with a sense of really to reestablish a sense of connection or to connect with the memories is really what in a way we're doing of the person who died. And we do work on this in the, in this order. So the, the treatment that we developed is, is has a, a fairly um, tight framework to it, although we're going to work in a very personalized way within that framework. But the framework is both within sessions and across sessions. And this one is the framework across sessions. So we start out focusing on understanding, understanding and accepting grief and then managing emotions. And then we move to helping people start to see a promising future, helping them to start to strengthen their relationships, et cetera. And each session of this treatment um, also is kind of structured where we, we deal with some loss related issue related to adaptation and then some restoration related issue. And 
we begin with a kind of review of the past week and, a, and end with a plan for the next week. But, but it's basically loss and then restoration. So it, while we're doing all this, we are looking for and finding ways to address these um, sort of, again, the, the, the derailers we, we tend to call these. So here's how we do it. We, to accept grief, we provide information about grief and, grief, and we, we use a grief monitoring tool that I'll show you in a minute. And that's really also how we work with emotions, but we focus it specifically on emotional pain and positive emotions. So we provide information about both and, um, and use the grief monitoring as well. To help people start to see a promising future, we do a procedure called aspirational goals work, and we also do a procedure called rewarding activities, which is sort of simple daily rewarding activities. Strengthening relationships, we use a procedure where we have a session with a visitor. Um, we use a procedure called imaginal revisiting to help people narrate the story of the death. A procedure we call situational revisiting, very similar to um, in vivo exposure for phobias, but um, that's what we do to live with reminders. And um, to connect with memories, we use some memories questionnaires and also a procedure called imaginal conversation with the person who died. So we center in all of this active listening. Any bereaved person, really anyone who's struggling with difficult emotions needs to be heard, but especially bereaved people need to feel heard and we need to listen. And so that is very centered in this work. And um, when we do that, we do it also in a way where we, this is not exactly a cognitive behavioral therapy in, in, the, in the sense that we don't generally, some therapists do it in a way that's closer to CBT, but, um, but we, we kind of, the way I do it and the way that I teach it is more in this way that when we listen closely to people and we ask the right questions and we're really there with them, they will often figure out themselves how to kind of move forward in whatever way we're trying to help them do it. Um, so just quickly understanding and accepting, um, understanding and accepting and honoring grief. We basically make the point that grief is natural. It's a form of love. We need to accept it and not judge it. A lot of people are asking themselves, you know, am I grieving too much? Am I grieving too little? You know, why am I grieving so much? They're, they're critical about how much or how they're grieving in some way. So we really make, we, we take the position that what, whatever grief is, is what it's supposed to be. So grief is really a reflection of the experience of the loss in the moment in this model. So it's, so it, as we adapt, it's going to naturally, our experience of it is going to become less and less intense and, and sort of um, dominating of our mind. But, but when it, increases again, that's totally fine. I mean, it will do that. And we don't want to try to, we don't want to try to change it at all. We want to allow it a place in our life. And we want to help people see that it naturally waxes and wanes. And that that's also fine, that that's a, a good thing. And why that's a good thing. And then monitoring grief can be helpful to see that. And, that, and I'll show you in a minute how we do that. And also, it can help notice what kinds of things trigger it and what kinds of things kind of help us set it aside for some period of time. And these are some of the common stuck points that, that we kind of watch for when we're doing this part of the treatment. Um, again, we, we tell people this, the same thing that I just told you, that grief is kind of complex and multifaceted, and that's natural, and because it is a stress response, and it's also the form love takes after someone we love dies, and it's going to evolve as we start to come to terms with that loss. So grief-related emotions, we want to help people observe them and name them. A lot of times people don't have that, initially don't have that capacity to name what they're feeling. They just know they're feeling bad or, you know, or upset. Um, and we definitely want people to refrain from judging themselves. We want them to practice self-compassion and mindfulness. And, um, and we want to help encourage them to share the pain and their troubling thoughts and let other people in us, of course, but also even other people in their lives as well. We we're always working towards that. Um, and along with this, we, we 
really want them to encourage both experiencing and also savoring positive emotions as well because when we're grieving sometimes we feel like we shouldn't have positive emotions that sort of survivor guilt takes over and we don't we we feel like there's something wrong with having positive emotions but we know that that positive emotions are are you know really really helpful they're physically helpful and they're cognitively they they help us problem solve they're they're very and they give us relief of course from the emotional pain so all of that is an important part to build into this so this is how we ask people to monitor grief so we really just invite them to take just five minutes at the end of the day and look back over the day and record write down a time one time during the day when grief was at its highest point and rate that if they can on a scale from one to 10, where, you know, 10 is the highest grief they've ever experienced, and one is very low grief. And, um, and then what was happening at that time? So maybe it was an eight, because um, it was eight when the person woke up in the morning, and they were, they woke up and they felt okay. And then all of a sudden, they remembered that the person had died, and their grief kind of spiked up. But it just says eight and I woke up in the morning. That's what this says. So you see, it doesn't take long to say that. And then we do the same thing with the lowest a time when the grief was at it, when grief was at its lowest and what was happening then. And then we just ask people to take a step back and just think, was this a high grief day, a medium grief day, a low grief day, and just say something about that. And then they do that every single day. And they begin to get a picture of what their grief looks like. And then when we, when we, um, they bring this back to a therapy session, we can kind of discuss with them. We pick one day, one high period and one low period and talk about it a little more. And that's where we can kind of get into um, some of the more detailed ways that they're experiencing grief and what they're doing after they experience high grief and, and um, et cetera. So then we move in the second session of, this is a 16 session model that we've developed and tested um, can be done in different ways, but that's how we tested it. Um, the second session, at the end of the second session, we do something we call aspirational goals work, which which we introduce that, which we say, you know, if grief was at a, you know, if your grief was at a manageable level, what would you want for yourself? And you know, we do that in a sensitive way that you know, that's sort of in towards the end of that second session. But basically what we're looking for is encouraging people to take time to consider what they care about, what's what, what they're really interested in, what their core values are, what kinds of things are important and meaningful to them. And, to, and, um, and then to think about, to start to think about a big long-term project that incorporates some of those interests and values and begin to plan that. And in addition, we also work in, in this, we start working this way and, and these carry through for the rest of the treatment, but on encouraging people to do some simple thing, we call it simple rewarding activities, some simple thing that is pleasurable or fun, something that evokes positive emotions each day. And that can be very sh a short period of time. It doesn't have to be a big deal, but just to plan to do something like that every day is a kind of ritual. Then to start to strengthen relationships, we um, again do this throughout the treatment, but we also encourage someone to invite a, a um, close friend or relative, someone, someone that's important to them in their life to come into the session, the third session, and we kind of talk about this whole model of grief way of understanding grief and and the idea of adapting to loss and what uh, what prolonged grief is all about. We we talk about all that with the person and we talk about their relationship a little bit. Mostly we we talk about how they met and what you know we we really kind of pull for the the caring that is virtually always there, but often these people, when someone has prolonged grief disorder, people around them have become very frustrated in there. They tend to be a little bit um, harsh and they're either avoiding the person, the bereaved person, or they're you know, saying things to them like, you know, pull yourself together, you have to move on, you know, stop wallowing in your grief, things like that, that is not that helpful. So we're, we're trying to kind of move that to a different place. So then um, we move in our fourth session to this procedure we call imaginal revisiting. And that, that's a very specific procedure that I'm not going to describe in detail today. But 
um, you can learn more about it if you if you're interested. But basically, it entails sharing the story of learning um, when the person died. So often that is often when someone dies of natural causes, the person has been at the bedside, the bereaved person has been at the bedside, it might be that. So they actually see the person die, or it might be that they got a phone call, it might be that they found out in, in some other way, but we start, um, we, want, we want them to tell what happened from that, from that time forward. And we can do, you can do that in, you know, we do that, as I said, in a very specific way, but um, it's, it's very, this is a very activating part of the therapy and it's hard for many therapists to do it until they kind of get used to it. And it's hard for the, the people that we're working with. Um, but it also is what people regularly tell us is one of the most helpful things that they do, if not the most helpful thing they do in the therapy. And they, and after we do this in the, in PGDT, we do this um, weekly for, um, usually three to six sessions in the middle of the therapy, starting in, in session four and going to maybe session nine or so. And then in around session five, we start making lists of things that the person is avoiding because they don't want to activate their grief. They don't want to be reminded of, that the person is gone. And this often um, in, entails looking at photos. They it very often, um, is hard to look at photos, but we, but anyway, we, we get them to make a list of these things to estimate how much their grief would be activated by it. And then we develop a, a kind of plan for them to start to do some of these things. Again, I said, as I said earlier, this is similar to, if you know, in vivo exposure as a CBT technique, it's very similar to that. It has some differences as well, but, um, but that's what we do. And then the last thing we do is work on um, really helping the person to feel the continued internal connection to the person who died. In this case, we're focusing on that aspect of the, of the sort of ongoing connection. And we do this with a series of memories questionnaires and also with um, inviting the person to have an imaginal conversation with the person who died in which they close their eyes and visualize themselves um, shortly after, with the person shortly after the person has died, imagining that the person can hear what they can, what they're saying and can respond. And then they take the role of the person who died and respond. And this is another, this is also a very, very powerful um, exercise, which interestingly we've, you know, it's, it's powerful and it doesn't feel as painful as retelling the story of the death. However, what we found is that when we've tried to do this early in the therapy and a number of people have tried it, um, it tends to kind of be actually too emotional. It can, tends to actually end up being even more painful for people. And um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have as positive an effect as it, when we move it to the end. So we have basically tested this approach in three different randomized controlled trials um, funded by the National Institute of Mental Health in the US, a total of 641 um, study participants have, people have participated in these studies. And they all compared this, each one of the three studies compared prolonged grief disorder therapy, which we used to call complicated grief therapy, just to be clear about that. Um, each one compared it to a, a proven efficacious treatment for depression administered by in two cases, it was this was interpersonal psychotherapy in our first two studies, one of which was our first study, which was any adult um, person with prolonged grief disorder that was published in JAMA in 2005. And our second study with IPT was done with older adults um, who ranged in age from 50, which actually isn't that old. But anyway, the, the mean age was 66, also not that old in my opinion, but um, and all the way up until I think our oldest person was in their 90s. <clears throat> and we saw the same exact thing in both of those studies, which was a, basically a 71% response rate to 
it was a little bit lower in our first study, but in our second study, it was 71% response rate to PGDT. And in both cases, it was a 30% response rate to IPT. And our last study, which was the largest one compared, um, actually was a study to see if antidepressant medication was would be helpful either with or without, when, when administered either with or without PGDT. And we expected it actually to be somewhat helpful. We thought that that this, we used citalopram, I'm not sure what that is in what you call that in the UK, but we used citalopram compared to placebo. And um, and I'll show you the results in a minute of that, but, but basically there was no difference between citalopram and placebo at all. We thought there would be, but there wasn't. And there was absolutely no difference between um, PGDT with citalopram compared to um, PGDT with placebo, which again, was a surprise, but if we, we, so we put the citalopram and placebo responses together in that what's called a control here. And, um, and that's also, and in, also includes the responses to IPT, which were a little bit lower. So um, this was, this was the study design, if you're interested. And these are the results, again, that I mentioned. Citalopram had a slightly greater response rate, but that's not a statistically significant difference, so it's not reliable. And um, there was absolutely no difference between citalopram plus placebo compared to citalopram. I'm sorry, <laughs> CGT or PGDT. However, one of the other interesting findings, and this, this is just, this slide shows some of the other um, outcome measures. So this is this is our um, this is the ICG, the Inventory of Complicated Grief Total Score, and this just shows you the same thing I just showed you in what it, what was our response responder clinical global impression response rate. But if we looked at depression symptoms, we saw something a little different, which is that citalopram alone did not did not help the depression in these people with prolonged grief disorder um, any more than placebo did. And, um, and actually PGDT without any um, citalopram also didn't help. Well, they, I guess they all helped. I, I, what I should say is they didn't, there was no difference between those three groups. But when we added citalopram to PGDT, then the depression symptoms did respond more. So for people who have both, the combination is somewhat better um, because it, it, it helps the depression as well as the prolonged grief disorder symptoms. So here are our three people. It finally dawned on me that just because I have family members who have died doesn't mean that he has forsaken me. So now I can go to church and feel free and feel as though I have a relationship with him. And one of the ways I, I can establish the relationship and keep it going um, is to read the Bible, which is something that was real important to my mom. The therapist helped me do some reality testing um, to help me get past the guilt feelings, like I could have done something, I should have done something to prevent her death. Um, and while I knew that intellectually, she helped me get to the emotional core of it. Um, and we relived that experience, I guess, for maybe three weeks. And finally, it dawned on, I really did all I could do. Well, that infected all areas of my life. I stopped being so reclusive. Um, I got in touch with um, people from my past in New Jersey. Um, I started making some plans professionally. I changed jobs. Um, I did a lot of things that I never would have dreamed of doing before. I can go back to reading. I can socialize again. I can meet new people and I don't have to tell them that I have lost a child, I can deal with them as we go on. Uh, if they ask, I tell them that I still have two children. One just happens to have died. I started taking yoga. So I made friends in the yoga class, we go for coffee, we go for bagels, we, we talk and talk. 
And uh, I just, it's wonderful. I mean, I'm human again. So just to end, um, you know, we consider grief to be a natural response to loss, complex and variable. There's no right or wrong way to grieve or right or wrong way to adapt to loss, but it is possible to get stuck in some of these natural early coping responses and develop prolonged grief. It's now a formal mental health diagnosis, which has been documented to occur in countries around the world, and it causes health, mental health, and functioning problems that are quite significant. And the good news is that there are efficacious interventions like the one that I just showed you, which are simple and available for people experiencing PGD. And of course, this is not the only way that people are treating it, and, and I think quite successfully, again, around the world. So I will stop at this point, and thank you so much for your attention. And I guess we can have questions. Or